God. I believe the Lord has a word for the women in the room today, and hopefully the men too. Men don't tune out just because this is Mother's Day. We have a lot to be thankful for for the mothers in the room, and I know my mom is here today, and I happen to think she's the greatest mom ever. Mom, could you stand up, please? Mothers are amazing. They're self-sacrificers. They give everything that they have for their kids. Um, I know some mothers um, may be sitting in the room. Unfortunately, you know, Mother's Day is not always a happy event for every woman. And we're celebrating women today. But there are women in this room that maybe, you know, don't feel like they've been the best mother. That's okay. God has a word for you today too. All right, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're not a mother, I believe God has a word for you, young woman of God. I believe God has a word for those who are not married. I believe God has a word just because he's going to speak to the women. And Mother's Day is less about um, physical birth as it is about who God says that we are. And that's what we're going to get into um, today as we get into the word of God. But mothers are amazing. I have the best mother ever. I know I do. I know you feel that way too. Are you guys ready to get into the word of God this morning? Will you pray with me? Will we focus our, our attention back on Jesus? Jesus, we worship you in this room. We thank you for the, uh, the presence, your sweet presence that's already been so evident today, Lord. We're believing you, Father, to turn the hearts of women, to open our hearts, Father, to who it is that you've called us to be today. Not just um, natural birthing of children, which, yes, you have um, given us the ability to do that. But, Lord, that you would call out of every woman, every name that you have spoken over her in your word, Lord. And we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that, that um, your perfect intent from the beginning for men and women is available to us because of you dying on the cross. And no matter what we've done, Lord, that you are faithful to us, Lord God. And we just thank you and we praise you for your word. We praise you for your truth today, Lord. We're believing, Father, that you would just do something mighty, Lord, that, that the signs and wonders, the miracle that you do in our hearts as you change us through your word would happen in this room. I declare it by the power of your spirit that your Holy Spirit would hover over every man and woman woman in this room, that your word would go forth with fire, Lord, that would get inside of us, that would change us, Lord God. We worship you for who you are. Lift your voice and worship him with me. Lord, we worship you. Give him another praise. There's 20 seconds of praise. Can you give Jesus some praise with me in this room? Let's stir up an atmosphere of praise, worshiping. Hosanna. Hosanna. We worship you. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for your saving power, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name. And there's actually power in names, too. Um, my husband and I, um, by the way, for those who are visiting us this morning, my husband and I are the youth pastors here at FAM. We get a, the opportunity of working with the youth of Mulberry. So welcome if you are new with us. Um, but my husband and I have a daughter named Jerrica, for those who do not know. And um, her name is actually spelt like Jericho in the Bible, but with an A on the end. And we actually had this name picked out for her way before she was, you know, even conceived or, or we, we had already thought of her, but she wasn't here yet. And we had a little girl in our first youth group that her name was Jerrica. And so uh, we, I just kind of had, you know, just close bond with this little girl. She would sit next to me in service, and she would put her little head on my shoulder, and she was fiery. She was a feisty little thing. Um, she was not, not shy, you know, um, but she was amazing. And so I kind of, um, we, we immediately, when we heard that name, we were like, wow, you know, that, that's a good name. I think we're going to name our daughter that when we have a daughter. And that was five, we were five, married five years before we ever had her. So that was years before. And um, <laughs> the thing is, we didn't really know what her name meant, um, but we kind of, I, I had a connotation, an association with that word based on the scripture and based on how when you read about Jericho in the Bible, it's a place where God gave his people a supernatural victory, not because of their strength or their battle strategy, but just because um, they had faith and they walked obediently to him. And so we, I, I, as a mom, declared you know, she's going to live a victorious life in Christ. And then later we found out that it actually means strong ruler. <laughs> and if those are the laughing in the room, it's because you've spent five minutes or an encounter with my little girl. Yes. <laughs> and she is a strong ruler. Um, when they brought her to us in the hospital, the nurse said, as soon as we pricked her little foot, she's been fussing at us the whole time. 
And when she started crawling, when you would make your way toward her like you were going to get her, instead of heading in the opposite direction, she would head straight for you. <laughs> so she is a strong ruler. So we claim over her that she'll be a strong, victorious ruler. And as great as that name is, that's just a name that we gave her. But God has even greater names for his sons and daughters in the room. He has greater, greater names that he has called. And today we're going to, the title of this message is What's in a Name? What's in a Name? And yes, we're focused on the ladies in the room. But guys, there's so much in this scripture. Men, there's so much in this scripture that speaks to both men and women. And it kind of goes along with, uh, the first part of it really goes along with the identity series that, that we've been hearing from pastor and where our identity um, comes from and where it starts. And so we're going to go back to the beginning today. And we're going to start in the in paradise that God created. And we're going to talk about um, the first name. So if you will open your Bibles with me, there are four names that we will be looking at today that speaks specifically to women, but the first is both for men and women. All right, and we're going to be starting at Genesis chapter 27. I'm sorry, not chapter 27. Chapter 1, verse 27. Chapter 1, verse 27. We're going to have quite a bit of scripture that we're going to look at, but we're going to focus on um, sections today. So um, let's let the word of God speak to us. But there's power in names, power in names. So the first name that we see is in Genesis. So we're just going to read this starting at verse 26 together. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Uh, this isn't a really, we're going to get into the intimate account of the details of man's creation of man and woman um, in the, the next name that we look at. But this is the first name that we see, image bearer image bearer. And even in, in just how we read it in the translation, it, it really, it doesn't even do justice to how it is in Hebrew. Like when you see the words written out using the Hebrew characters, it's very powerful. But one thing that this says to us is this, it says, regardless if you're a man or woman, that God has ascribed value and dignity to your life. He says you're valuable. He says you're created in his image. Now he created them together. Right, male and female as one, but yet there's distinctions, right, between them. Female, male and female. We have a masculine and a feminine image bearer for God. Now this speaks to all of us, all of us, because it, it, this is where our value comes from. It comes from nobody else. It comes from nothing that we believe. We can think all the good thoughts we want to think about ourselves too. It doesn't matter. This is, this is the truth. This is what God says. He says that we are created in his image, that we are, dis we are created as one, but we're distinct. And that each of us is valuable because each of us um, possesses the ability to reflect part of God that we can't reflect without the other. Okay, women together are distinctly, we're, we're, we're different, right? We're the same, but we're different. All humanity, equal in value and dignity. We've got to get that. We're in a culture where men and women want to fight each other. Okay, women think they have to prove that they're better than a man. But God says right here, there's no reason to have to prove anything. There's no reason to have to prove anything, men or women. We're not superior or inferior. You're both created in my image. You're both valuable. You're both dignified. You're capacitated with creativity and an ability to reason and morals. You can, you can live morality out. You have the ability to communicate and to speak where other created things don't. You're placed above these other created things. I gave you them to have dominion over them, to rule over them. But, but you're unique. You're special. But one is man and one is woman. And together we have the full expression of God's image. One by itself doesn't fully express God's image. Together they express um, God's image. Now I'm not saying that if you're single you're not representing God's image because we're going to see in the scripture differently in just a minute. But um, we see that they are not indispensable. They're, I mean, they're, not, they're indispensable. They're not interchangeable. You can't change them out. Their roles are designed by God. They're valuable but they're different. 
And so we see here, um, I'm, I, I don't speak Hebrew, but as I was studying this, it was so powerful because in Hebrew, when you see the man, the word man, it means ish. And woman means isha, or female means isha. All right, and when you look at them and how they're written in Hebrew, they both, in, in um, English, it almost looks like an N and a W, but that's not what they are. That, that's sort of what they look like. And they basically are spelled the exact same, but God, he takes and he puts a masculine little mark in the masculine name, and he takes and he adds a character to the female name, but they, they basically, they're the same, but they're different. Do you see that? Even in Hebrew, it's so powerful as you, as you look at the, that. They both have, um, this is what the, the W is the shin. I'm just going to say that because I don't really, it's the shin. That's the name of the character. And what that means is this, and both men and women have this. It means burning bush. It's the same word used to talk about the burning bush or the tree of life or the spirit. Get that. We both have the shin and we have the aleph, which is God's attributes, his attributes. We both have those, but then God takes and he puts a characteristic that distinguishes masculinity from femininity. All right, and this is where I want to talk to the women for, for just a minute. Your name, your first name is female image bearer, bearer. Female image bearer. Femininity. Not feminist. Femininity. It's not whether you like to go fishing or you like to go shopping. Whether you like to shoot a gun or bake cookies, whether you like high heels, it's not about the personality, the superficial. It's about a heart. It's about a heart of being, of being feminine, of being who God created you to be, of being a re relational, being a nurturer, being um, celebrating your uniqueness, not having to try to be who um, other people are. It's not so much the personality, it's the heart of the matter. It's countercultural. It really is. And the young women, you need to hear this. It's countercultural to know who you are in Christ. It's countercultural not to be a feminist. It's, it's countercultural. Cultural. In the 1800s is when feminism, I'm thankful I get to vote, okay? I'm thankful for some of the rights that came with the feminist movement and how we, be, you know, women got treated a little bit better sometimes. But if men and women got a hold of this, there would be no need for a feminist movement because men wouldn't be ruling with a heavy hand and women wouldn't need to prove themselves. But that's where it started because women began to feel inferior. They forgot who they were. They forgot that they were, they were the feminine. They represent the feminine attributes of Christ. They're not supposed to be men. It got really distorted. It's distorted in our culture. Femininity is not weakness. It's strength. It's grace. It's walking. It's walking like, like he created you to walk. All right, so that's the first name um, is female image bearer. But we're all image bearers, right? If we get that right, man, will that set the, the course of things in, in place. Um, so we're going to look at a more intimate account, one of my most favorite accounts in Scripture. Um, I have meditated upon this because um, I love to go back here. You guys, you guys need to get back here this week and look back and see what God says about you. Um, but in Genesis chapter 2, um, this is where it was, we're so special to him that God actually set apart another chapter where he would get a little bit more detailed in his account of how he created uh, men and women. All right, one of my favorite, favorite portions of scripture that we see many distinctions in men and women just by the words that Adam spoke. All right, by the, the order of the way that God created things, by um, his intimacy with his son and then with his daughter. So we're going to jump to um, chapter 2 in Genesis. I'm going to read from 5 to, I don't know, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> chapter, um, we're going to start though at 5. It says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of ground from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the, the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skipping to verse 15. 
So the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You shall surely eat of the of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge and good of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So I just want to back up a minute. Now, this, the second name that we're going to look at in just a minute is um, helper, fit for him, help meet, helper suitable for. All right, but first you got to get this because God takes this man and he forms him. And this speaks to how he wants a, a relationship. He wants intimacy with every man and every woman because he basically breathes into his nostrils like a, a kiss. That's the old, closest thing I can think of, somebody putting their, themselves that close to you, close to their nostrils, that he breathed as though he was kissing this man, breathed his breath into him, and then he became a living being. And God spent time with Adam. He was spending time with him. I don't, Adam wasn't moping around the garden. Oh me, oh my, looking for a woman. Although God did place it in him that they were one, so I'm sure there was something that he realized, you know, that, that he was looking for, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. But yet he, God was, you know, he, was, he had the job of his dreams, okay? He was walking with God. He had the jo job of his dreams. He's using his creativity. He's naming all the animals, spending time with God. He wasn't walking around, moping around. He had a connection with his father, all right? But God said... It's not good for man to be alone. Adam didn't say, oh, God, give me help. No. God said it was not good for man to be alone. And so he um, decides to make a match for Adam, a helper fit for him. And let's just stop there for a minute. Because sometimes we get this weak, um, we have this weak connotation with what it means to be a helper, like almost like a little sidekick. Okay, and that's not what God is saying. And sometimes women resent, I think, this title, this name, because we don't fully grasp what it means. But in Scripture, it's not weak. It's not a sidekick that God is naming. Help meet is derived from two words, azir, which means to rescue, to save, to be strong, and konegdo, which is the mirror, to mirror his opposite. And basically means that she possesses the other half of the qualities or the attributes that he doesn't have. Okay, so sometimes we don't like this because it sounds like you're a sidekick. But basically, helper means one who supplies strength in the area lacking. Does not indicate that they're stronger than the one they're helping. Okay, women. Um, it just means that they are a savior, a rescuer that uses their strengths to complement what he doesn't have. It's powerful. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> I know my husband shares the stories, um, you know, of, of how I help him. Sometimes he probably sees things that I don't, you know, see in how I help him. But we do compliment each other, right? Those that are, are, are married um, get that. But this doesn't just speak to those who, you know, are married. All right, but this is who God created all women to be. Not that you go, ladies who are not married, young women, that you go attach yourself and try to be the helpmate to everybody that you date. Okay. But there's something inside of us, there's something inside of our hearts that God's placed there to be strong, to be a savior, not savior like Jesus, but to resemble him, to, to be a rescuer, to go after those who need nurturing, that need relationship. Um, but not, I'm not talking about relationships like the opposite sex, so don't, don't go there. All right, but, but that's what but God calls a woman. She's countercultural. Okay, we want to fight for our rights. Um, it's called weak to be a helper. Okay, but that's not what scripture says. It's not weak, ladies. It's strong. That's who God designed us to be. Be countercultural. We're not, we train young women to be independent, self-sufficient, selfishly ambitious. And I am all about, um, you know, being successful and doing everything to the glory of God. But I was very disillusioned when I became a wife and a mother and trying to live things God's way um, and having that burning in my heart to be who God created me to be. But culture had cultivated something different in my life. It didn't match. When I became a mom, oh my goodness, like 
there was, it was a, a moment where I saw her take her first breath and every, all those other selfish things that, not that they're not good, don't hear me, girls can go to college, girls can do that, girls can, I work full time and be moms, but, but that's, that's not cultivating the woman of God on the inside to just focus about those things or to be selfishly ambitious because, man, if that's what we train our young, I'm talking about Christian young women here. If that's what we train our Christian young women to be, man, will they be miserable. Man, will they be miserable because they won't, they'll, 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 be, t- they'll be in a tug of war all the time of, of trying to achieve and to be something out here that, with a lack of integrity because God didn't create them to desire to be um, like a man. All right, now I'm not saying we can't be successful in the workplace and not to do our best and to be the helpers and all those things, but but. If that's all we put our, our hope in, there will be a day where it will be very disappointing to you, young woman. Because that's not who God has um, spoken you um, to be. And then we see how God fashions this woman, which is why we're fashionably late all the time. Um, God decides to make a helper. So that was the second name, helpmate. But God decides to fashion for Adam um, someone that will match him, right, a helpmate for him. And so God puts Adam to sleep, okay? He doesn't need input on all her features, okay? He doesn't need Adam to do that. But I believe there's something more powerful in this. Sometimes women think that God created man first, and that means man's more important. But I want you to hear me, young woman of God. He put Adam to sleep because he wanted time with you. All right, he put Adam to sleep because just like he spent time with man, he wanted to spend time with his women, All right, he wanted to spend time. He wanted a relationship with her before he opened Adam's eyes because that speaks to God's priority. And this is especially for the single young ones in the house is that God didn't didn't keep Adam awake and he didn't line up all these girls in front of him and say, hey, pick this one or that one or, you know, whichever one you you like. No, he he didn't do that. He made her and him and they they had a vertical connection with God. They had intimacy with him. And then he brought them together at the right time, in the right moment, for the right things, in the right way. They didn't have to go seeking. And his eyes had never been tainted by pornography. And his eyes had never had to. And sometimes it's not on purpose. Our young men have to walk through the mall. And they have to see Victoria's Secrets hanging out. Okay, but he didn't have all that stuff. There, there hadn't been that stuff yet. And so God then brings this woman to the man and he wakes him up, right? And what does Adam do? I'll read it first before I paraphrase. He says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Because at, or Eve was created different. She was taken out of the side of man. Um, also speaks to the helper in her, right? And to become alongside of him. Um, woman means she man or woman with a womb. But I'm going to paraphrase Adam first. At last. Whoa, baby. <laughs> Woo! Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, right? He was speaking words that captivated her heart. He was captivated by her beauty. He was captivated. It didn't matter if she matched up to somebody. He didn't never, he'd never seen anything else. Um, speaks to the importance of guarding your eyes and your heart, young men. But he was captivated. And then th- this speaks to how God, you know, from the very beginning, he's captivated by her. But then Eve, I can imagine what those words meant to her heart. And who God created her to be. Because what he was saying was, I'm going to take you. I'm going to protect you. You're part of me. You're part of my bone. You're part of my flesh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch over you. I'm going to protect you. Like God calls men to be the head, right? To love like Christ loves. Even laying down his life. And so um, Adam, not God, but Adam named her woman. Um, I don't think this, this name fully encompasses, I think he discovers, as we'll see with the last name, exactly what kind of that, that meant. Because it kind of means she-man or womb. But what it does mean is that women do have the capability of bearing in their womb. In fact, a woman um, is the gateway, right, to birth. Even Jesus Christ came through the womb of a woman, right? We can't, we can't do this thing with just men or just women. Um, women have the gateway to life within their body, the gateway to life within their body, the ability to produce life. And this just doesn't mean like just physical birth, if we have any women in the room who haven't had a child, but to birth a vision, right, to birth by, um, by mothering those around them, not just those that they've like physically given birth to, but to, 
be a gateway, right, that leads people um, to Christ. But this name doesn't fully encompass, like, really all of Eve. It's just part of what she can do, right? It's a major part. She's a womb. She has a womb. She's like him, though. I think you saw her really like him in this name, you know, woman, she, man. Um, but in all my study, I really couldn't find much more to, like, distinguish that. But it does speak to the beauty of being able to carry a child in your womb. And I can't tell you how many times I hear young women and um, people talk about children and things like this. Um, just another mouth to feed right? Or um, I'm never having kids. I'm never having kids. You know, part of God's blessing was the ability of reproduction. And I have, um, I have a, a couple, two sisters that are pregnant right now. One of them has a fairly large family. She's about to have number five. And I've heard people say, say things about her because she's about to have another baby. Okay? And, and um, and I don't think they intentionally, they're just saying it because it's what culture cultivates in us. But it's part of the blessing of God to be able to have a womb and to be able to bring life into this world. And it's not just another mouth to feed. That could be the next, I don't know. Um, let's see. Oh, for example, James Robinson. I don't know if you guys are familiar with James Robinson. His mother was actually raped. His mother was actually raped and she gave birth to him. And James Robinson has built wells that feed people all over the world, or not feed people, but give people clean water to drink all over the world. All right, so you never know what will come out of the womb of a woman or who um, will come. But then we have this tragic story. Eve began to look. I'm, I'm going to go into chapter 3 in just a minute. And I'm coming to, I promise you I'm coming to the last name, the most important name. Not, I don't know if it's the most important. They're all important. But it's a very important name that God has given um, to women. But basically Eve began to look. She had everything. She, did, she didn't know any pain. There was no marital conflict between her and Adam. Um, there was, there, you know, they had this perfect place to live. They had everything going on in the garden. There was nothing um, for her to be looking for anything else for. She had God's presence. They had God's presence walking with them. Um, but there was, there was something that happened. Eve began to look at what she didn't have, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, instead of what she did have, the true tree of life, the Lord's presence. She began to look at that. Um, the enemy, the serpent, in chapter 3 comes along and says he was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And he said to the woman, did God actually say that you cannot eat from the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not, not die. For God for God knows that if you eat, you'll basically be like him. And I'm going to skip a little bit here and go down. Um, we know, um, just for those who don't know the story, Eve ends up, you know, falling for this trick of Satan, looking at what she didn't have instead of what she did have. And so she ends up sinning big time, right? And um, Adam, who was rightfully um, the one who should have, you know, been in authority, they're both guilty. Not one is more guilty than the other. Um, but she used her saving, rescuing, strengthening influence that she had upon the man for a negative influence instead of the influence that God had given her. Instead, she led him to be deceived as well because women have been given that, that helper that speaks to the influence that we have with men. And so she used it and, um, she, you know, her husband sends with her. But right after, I'm going to read the curse that God speaks to them after they sin, and I'm going to end on verse 20. It says, because you've done this, and he's talking to the serpent first, because Eve said, what did Eve say? Who did Eve, well, the serpent blamed, or the Eve blamed the serpent, Adam blamed Eve, but they all three got in trouble, all right? So um, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust. You shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring, your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your, your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, 
Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not you shall not eat of it. Curses the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. All right, here's this woman who probably feels in that moment like many of us have felt, not just women, men and women, she's messed up big time. She realizes the consequences because immediately there's been a death that has occurred. Not just, not really physically per se, um, but the spiritual disconnect between um, her God and her, and her God and Adam. And so immediately there's been consequences. And I can imagine that, that she was just not in a good place. Um, she was um, realizing that not only did it cause her to sin, but it would cause, it cause her, her husband to fall. It would cause mankind to fall. She saw things differently than she had ever seen them before. Things no longer looked perfect like they were in the garden. All of a sudden in this curse, um, this brought some things. Um, not just the fact that the childbirth would be, but childbearing, the, the act of bringing up children. If you've ever had a child, I talk to women all the time who have women, child, children who have gone astray, right? Um, it's not just the process of giving birth, but it's going to be... You know, it's going to be harder now. And this is the thing. You, ladies, you're going, to want, you're going to want to rule over your husband. You're going to have a desire to rule over him. There's going to be a battle from here on out. There's going to be conflict in the leadership and the roles in your home, um, which is completely contrary to the other names that women have been given. There's going to be a conflict. And he is going to rule over you. He's going to distort how he rules over you. Okay, this is, this is what the curse did. Con contradictory. She was in a place, Adam speaks this name over his wife. Hear me, husbands. He speaks this name over his wife at a time where she had messed up. She didn't look like she had it all together. She had sinned big time. She had messed up. She had failed big time. He had failed big time. But he speaks this word of life over her. Eve means, and this is the fourth name, Eve means life giver. The mother of all living. Now at this point, her and her husband hadn't had Cain and Abel. Because in chapter 4, you see where they know each other and they actually give birth and their, their children do suffer consequences because of their choices. But at this point, that's not, he's not just speaking to people who have had their own natural children. He's speaking figuratively to all of us women that he, um, at this point in her life, he calls her life giver, mother of all that are living. This name encompasses all the other names. Okay, because it's out of her life giving that she's a help meet. All right, now she gets her life from being an image bearer because she spends time with God and his, he breathes, you know, his breath into her, his spirit, the tree of life, right? Um, but this encompasses how she is a help meet and how she is a womb, how she births children, how she raises them, not only her natural children but the, the people around her that she's pouring her life into. But life giver really encompassed who God intended for this woman to be. But she had strengths. This woman, she had weaknesses. She sinned big time and she messed it up. But you know what? But God. He still called her life giver. Women of God, these are the names that God has spoken over us. He's spoken over us and, and men. He's spoken over you that you're an image bearer. We're equal in value and dignity. We don't have to fight for, we don't have a power struggle. In the body of Christ, we shouldn't have a power struggle. In our marriages, we shouldn't have a power struggle. We have to stop sinning because it's sin either way on men's part and women's part and, and have the humility of Christ, right, um, come upon us and, and work through us to do things. Christ provided a way for us to live this out. Okay, now we started in the beginning because this is what God's intent was, right, and then we have this fall. But Jesus, we talked about coming to the cross this morning. But Jesus is the tree of life. He is the ultimate life giver. He is the one who when we come and we submit our lives to him, he empowers us through his spirit to be who he intended for us to be. And we can't do it without him. And so he's calling us back to the heart of what a true woman 
is this morning. Ladies, um, as we celebrate, this is actually the first Mother's Day. It had little to do with the physical birth of a child. This is where Adam named her mother of all living. This is the first Mother's Day. So I don't know where you find yourself this morning. There are women um, who look at Mother's Day in different ways. I, I say this, started this at the beginning. There are some, um, we celebrate the great mothers that we have. We celebrate them. And then there are some that are grieving because they've never, they're, they're, their mother's no longer with them to, sell, you know, to, to celebrate. They're still happy over the memories that they have, but maybe their mother has passed away. You have women who have never given birth, who are barren. You have women who have um, had miscarriages. You have women who are celebrating because they have new life. We have some baby bumps around here, right? Some new life coming that are celebrating. But Mother's Day isn't always um, necessarily rosy for every woman. There was a time where I hated Mother's Day because I had had an abortion. And when I became a Christian on Mother's Day, when it would be celebrated in our church inside, I would not like it. But the reason was is because I hadn't got a hold of what God said about me and his word. And that motherhood was not defined by my mistakes or by my past or any of that. That it was defined by the names that he had given me. 